This is Al Black, and this is the poet, Tim Conroy. Welcome, Tim. My brother, Al. I'm excited about today. Yes. And we are honored today to have, as our last poet of this series, the poet, Ken McCullough. Welcome. Well, thank you. The, the pleasure is all mine. Ken McCullough was born in Staten Island, New York, but spent his formative years in St. John's, Newfoundland. More recently, he has drawn inspiration from the mountains of Montana and Wyoming and the Blufflands of the Upper Mississippi. In 1992, he was adopted into the mini Conchu band of the Lakota Nation. He is a graduate of St. Andrew's School the setting for Dead Poets Society, and has degrees from the University of Delaware and the Writers' Workshop of the University of Iowa. McCullough's most recent books of poetry are <laughs> Sycamoro Ora Pendola, published in Columbia, Broken Gates and Dark Stars, as well as a book of stories, Left Hand. He has received numerous awards for his poetry. McCullough has worked closely with Cambodian poet Yu Sam Er, survivor of the Pol Pot regime. They have published Sacred Vows, a bilingual edition of Yu's poetry, and Crossing Three Wildernesses, a memoir. McCullough has two sons, Galway and Orion. He lives on a farm outside Winona, Minnesota, with his wife, Lynn Nankaville, a playwright. In 2014, McCullough began his second term as Poet Laureate of Winona. Welcome, Ken. Tell us a little bit about your poetry journey, your early influences, and how you became a poet. Well, <clears throat> I think it all came out of moving frequently and hearing different voices. Listening to my relatives in Staten Island was very different from listening to my relatives in Mississippi. Uh, when we lived in Newfoundland, I listened to that real carefully because, man, that was a totally different world. And as it turned out, we had actually had some relatives up there too. So I think hearing those, hearing the music in those other voices was uh, what pushed me into poetry. When I started writing uh, at that particular time, we were all being pushed toward becoming doctors and lawyers and CEOs. And uh, I knew I wasn't going there. I thought I was going to become a doctor. And I did major in biology. But meanwhile, I was starting to spin some words. I think even during the days when I really didn't know what I was doing with the words, I was listening to recordings of poets. So I heard uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, for example, a very distinct voice. And I, I heard Dylan Thomas, who became one of my idols. And in fact, I, I have a, a Dylan Thomas one-man show that I do in which I, I become Dylan Thomas. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I think listening rather than reading the stuff on the page is is what took me into poetry and even though i you know the the oral tradition is not something that i'm particularly close to i think that's the part of poetry that um had the biggest influence on me bob dylan uh has been more important to me than any 10 other poets leonard cohen same thing. Uh, they're sort of two faces of the same coin. And, uh, you know, I've, I've gotten more out of listening to them than I, I have out of listening to some of my other uh, 
my poetic heroes. Uh, my my older son is named after Galway Cannell, who's a, a person I always revered. But I, I would say that uh, uh, Dylan and Leonard Cohen are are right up there with him. Within that, what was the first poem you remember hearing or reading? It was uh, a, re a recording of uh, Donald Crisp. Do you remember him? The British actor. Mm -hmm. It was under the spreading chestnut tree, and it, you know it goes on from there. Uh, so, my father, who came within three credits of of having a college degree, but never had a college degree, always made sure that we had lots of books around. And uh, when we were in Newfoundland, for example, we were fairly isolated, but he always sent off for recordings of things for us to listen to folk music. So, you know, Burl Ives, that sort of thing. And, and these, uh, uh, sort of classic, well, the poems that you would find in that book, 101 famous poems, those kinds of poems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have my mother's copy. Yes. After I learned. And, and, People of, of our parents' generation, well, I know that, that uh, my wife's mother died when she was 97, and she could not remember who we were, but she could quote The Highwayman in its entirety. Uh, and I think that's really characteristic of that generation. You, you would run into uh, old duffers at parties who would just break into... Gunga Din, that sort of thing, the whole thing, you know. <laughs> and uh, I, I think I, I'm I'm sorry that that's not part of uh, the, the what kids are getting right now. I think I thought I, I uh, one of my duties as uh, poet laureate was to go into the community and try to connect with different groups that I thought needed it. So I went into the middle school. And I brought with me elders, people my age or older. And all of us recited poetry. There was one uh, Christian brother from a nearby college who recited something uh, of Ovid's in Latin uh, that he had memorized in fourth grade. So I said, to, and, and I knew the teacher who organized this for the junior high. I knew her pretty well. I knew she was a real pusher. So I said, well, I, I'm really sorry that your generation is not learning poems. And she held up her hand and she said, excuse me. And she had all of her students stand up. And I can't remember what the poem was, but I think it was Robert Frost. They began, in, began reciting Robert Frost in unison, 40 of them. And so I was wrong. And it's nice to hear, you know, that the, the kids are getting those poems in their ears. They're hearing rap music and they're hearing the way words are used that way. But they're also hearing, you know, some of the, uh, the throwback poems, mm. which are certainly as important they are getting it ken if, if you could go back in time and talk to the young poet <laughs> um what advice would you give to young ken mccullough about poetry that you know now and what did that young poet teach you well i guess i would i would have told him don't pay attention to everybody around you, you know, the, the, the what, uh, what Al read, you know, that I had attended the school where Dead Poet Society was filmed. <laughs> the setting was exactly the same. And it was it set during that period of time when I was there. So the idea that somebody would actually become a poet was absurd. 
uh, I would have told him, you have to do this. You have to keep this poetry thing going. Even if you're doing something else on the surface, you need to, to dig deep into that and, uh, and never, never let it fall away. Because I would say up until my senior year of college, it was just something I, I would come down to breakfast uh, and go into the the uh, dining hall and tell the assembled people my bizarre dream from the night before. And then later in the day, I'd write it up and it would be you know, a very goofy kind of thing, uh, sort of an, uh, a, a, a lame version of beat poetry. But my uh, final semester, I knew I wasn't going to go to medical school. I had applied to the writer's workshop at the University of Iowa and uh, thought I'd better write some poetry. I was studying for my graduate record exams and I had big gaps. I hadn't read anything in the Victorian period, et cetera. So I got out all of the, uh, uh, the anthologies and started looking through them and looking at key words. So, you know, what are the key words you find in Keats? What are the key words you find in Wordsworth? So uh, the Academy of American Poets contest was coming up uh, a week later. So I made myself a schedule. Monday, three sonnets. Tuesday, a villanelle, a sestina, two, three free verse, the rest of the week that way. So I submitted all this stuff. And it was all absolutely derivative. What I did was I plugged in these words from Keats and Shelley and Wordsworth and who knows, Coleridge. And I'm sure the judges who are all academics read through them and said, oh, this is very reminiscent of Keats. Well, obviously it's reminiscent of Keats. And I won the contest and I thought, hmm, this is a pretty easy game. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it turned out not to be that easy a game, but it did give me that that encouragement to think that uh, I had I had at least some sense of of what was going on. And and during college, I, I did get to to play Dylan Thomas in the play Dylan. And, and that helped also, except that one night. I thought. You know, Dylan Thomas drank a lot so that I would come to rehearsal drunk. Did not work. You cannot do Dylan Thomas when you're drunk, except maybe if you're Dylan Thomas. And I guess it took me a while to get Dylan Thomas out of my system. And and I, I still have a number of poems that now and then when I read, I'll say, OK, I'm going to give you this poem twice. Here's the way I would normally read it. And here's the way, if I were Dylan Thomas, here's the way I would read it as Dylan Thomas. And uh, it, it's strange to hear that it's still buried there in in my work. And, and I hope it, it stays there. Well, Ken, how about if we get you to read a couple poems? Uh, okay. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about what collection they're from and, and something about their poem. And maybe a little bit after you read a couple poems, talk a bit about your formal writing practice. Okay. Start with one that's not in any collection yet. It's the beginning poem from a uh, a sequence about my father, who was born outside of Vardaman, Mississippi. And if you know anything about Mississippi politics, Senator Vardaman was a fairly odious kind of person. <laughs> so I, I'm going to weave that into the sequence somehow. I'm not sure yet. Due south of Vardaman, back in the red dirt hills where roads were Sisyphean in spring, my dad was raised in the church of the baked and forsaken, where the congregation sang a cappella twice on Sundays and that high Appalachian wine backed by a small red squeeze box, blessed are the meek, 
for they shall inherit hands of stone. Where the men formed a square and one at a time blurted unvarnished prayers in that Deuteronomy diction. On the way home after the late service, our family harmonized with whippoorwills. He is buried there where incense of pickup exhaust, chitterlings and honeysuckle mix with a whiff of redemption. Where red tick hounds in hard packed dooryards bay and tongues as if stung by the spirit. Where the houses are smaller every year, stripped for firewood, subsumed by kudzu. As I say, that's, that's going to be part of a sequence. Uh, um, one book I'm reading right now is a book about, uh, it's called Backwater Blues. It talks about the, the flood of 1927, the Mississippi, and how that influenced the blues, how most of our major blues singers in one way or, way or another came out of that experience. And so, you know, e even though I didn't live through it, my father lived through it, he never said anything about it, but I'm somehow, I think, I think I'm going to be able to conjure up some of what he thought and what he saw. I'll go back and read a, uh, an older poem. Uh, this is from a collection titled Obsidian Point. It's a book in three sections. Uh, the first section is about uh, going up into the back country of Yellowstone on a vision quest after uh, being instructed by a, uh, a Northern Cheyenne elder. Uh, the second part of it is about going up there 15 years later to the same spot and then going up there a third time several years after that. Uh, so this is a, a poem that I wrote for my older son, Galway, after I, I came out of that uh, first experience. Uh, I went up there and fasted for four days. And it was in late September, which is sometimes risky in, in the Rockies. Uh, had a lot of really wonderful experiences up there. And when I came back, I tried to write, I thought I'd be able to write a lot of poems. I got nowhere. And finally, I thought, well, maybe one poem. And so this is the poem that emerged. And uh, it's entitled Instructions. And there's a reference in the first line to the backbone. The backbone is the, the Rockies. Most of the Plains tribes refer to it as the backbone of the earth. Instructions. Trace the backbone to where it disappears. There, gentians suck the color from the sky. You will see dancers barely visible, stumbling through the aspen as if drunk. When you hear a crow's call rise like hunger, traveling south, turn and sit. A fine pollen will settle on your hair and shoulders. Bring no weapons. Several bears will cross you. Even if a grizzly raises up and paws the air, hold your ground, breathe, speak sharply. It will be years before you get here. The first time, be alone. If you need me, look over your shoulder 50 paces back. Call, and I will see with you through your eyes. And on this morning, this first morning, you will sense love, the skin laid out for you to put on for the rest of your life. It will be blue, not the color of mountains as the sunlight fades or of morning, but the color of feathers and of eyes and of old ones who live beneath the snow. You will hear the rhythms of an ocean 
and your body will rise in slow spirals up to the high place. From there, you will see a deep obsidian face of your past. Deny the terrors. Let the quick lightning writhe through you to set root at the center of the earth. It will turn your blood to vapor. You will smell then something like gardenias, but far beyond its wildest echoes. So clean, you will weep tears of tourmaline. You will know then when to come down. Follow the old road, the glad ice on the stream of light. There are no dams here. The bark on your hands will be white, my sons. Your eyes, green moons. Begin running ahead of time, into time. No matter. You can dream now forever. Wonderful. Beautiful. Thank you. And, and I should say that uh, when I, I wrote that poem, my son was five. He's now 50. Uh, and he took, he took those instructions to heart. Uh, he was adopted into the uh, 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 Anishinaabe tribe, the Ojibwe, and uh, speaks the language fluently and uh, really absorbed their culture. And uh, they, they accepted him. And he, he's, uh, th that's still, a, even though he lives in Brooklyn, <laughs> uh, that's still a strong part of his life. And it's still a strong part of my life as well. Mm. And I should say that I think when I, when I was first at the writer's workshop, uh, the first class I was in, there were 15 students, the first poetry writing class. 10 of them already had books out. Um, I had published three poems in, you know, the, the prep school magazine. That was it. So it was intimidating. Uh, what I thought I would do is write mystical poems, uh, whereby if, if people pan them, I could say, well, you know, you're just, you're, you're not, you don't understand that realm of, of being. And uh, mysticism is, is still an important part of what I'm interested in and, you know, what I, what I read and so forth. But my poetry is, this poem is, I think, steeped in mysticism, the one I just read. But a lot of what, what I write is uh, steeped in uh, horse manure, for example. Uh, <laughs> the realities of life. <laughs> I have to go out and, uh, and clean the barn. And so I do a lot of thinking while I'm out there doing that. Mm -hmm. As a poet, often the subject of revision comes up. Yeah. How much revision do you do? And, and uh, do you do revising of poetry with a pitchfork in your hand? In the barn? It, it, it depends on the poem. You know, there, there are some poems that I revise while I'm sleeping. I'm, 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 I can see the words there. <laughs> I'm crossing things out. I'm substituting things. And it's in my, my dream. So nine times out of 10, I don't remember what those changes were, at least not on a, a conscious level. Well, some poems I don't do much revision on. They seem to come, they're, they're there. And there are others. I know that there was a poem I wrote in probably 1968, six lines long. Uh, and I had a friend who was, he was uh, studying for his PhD in psychology, but he had a good ear. And I would stop at his house every day and I would recite to him alternate lines for the ending of this poem. And he'd just shake his head. And 
And that was in 1968. And I've probably written thousands of alternate lines to end that poem. And I'm not there yet. Uh, but I'm not like well, Donald Hall, for example. I know uh, in one essay, he talks about revising one poem 450 times. Uh, I just don't have that much patience and uh, I, I don't have that much time either. So revision is important, an important part of my process. I'm, I'm part of a poetry group as you know, many of us are. And uh, I listen to some of what they tell me, uh, but other parts of it I, I ignore. But it is a useful, it is useful to have uh, a sounding board or some sounding boards. Uh, for many years, I, I had a, a fellow poet named Ray De Palma, who was, I guess you would call a language poet. In other words, on the surface, you couldn't understand what he was writing. But it was brilliant. And uh, he, for some reason, liked what I wrote and uh, published some of it in his magazine. And we would talk maybe three times a week. He, he died a couple of years ago. And uh, he, he would... He, he would read everything I wrote and, and make suggestions. And uh, I guess he was the one person whose advice that I, I took very carefully. My wife, I pay attention to what she says. <laughs> uh, and uh, she's probably my, my toughest critic. You, you asked about the, I think the routine. I, I don't have a, a set routine, you know. I don't, I don't get up at seven thirty and and work for two hours and then go out and do chores and then come in and blah blah blah. Uh, my my life is uh, at at this late age is still chaotic. You know, I haven't figured out how to 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 prune it down, mm -hmm. but I am getting better at taking notes and and keeping track of things. You know, it used to be that I had a pad next to the bed and if I had an idea, I'd wake up and write it down. But two years ago, I had a, uh, a terrible fall. I fell down two flights of stairs uh, in total darkness, head first. And both my hands got bent back. And uh, so I can no longer write legibly with my writing hand, my left hand. So now I write with my right hand very slowly. And uh, it, it makes me think on a, on a different level. Uh, I can't really explain what that level is, but uh, I do have to slow things down in general. Mm. I, I walk more slowly. I don't run anymore. I think more slowly. I forget things, so that's you know that's the uh, uh, the instrument I'm dealing with these days. Can you share a couple more of your poems with us? Sure. Yeah. Actually, uh, what I'm going to read comes from a book of prose pieces that started out as uh, as poems. Tim, you'll you'll relate to this. I was a, uh, a bat boy for an Air Force team. And I was 14 and 15 at the time. And some of these guys were, were pretty good. And they let me pitch bat batting practice. So I had, you know, this inflated sense of <laughs> where I might go as a baseball player. I want to read one of these. It doesn't have many swear words in it. The title of, of this sequence is Memories of an Air Force Bat Boy, Upper Peninsula, Michigan, late 50s. Carl Belfatti. Carl Belfatti, right-hander from Philly, fit his name. 
He was a beautiful fat man. His fastball dipped like a barn swallow. He jammed right in, right-handers with his inshoot, breaking off the bats in their hands, at least three a game when he was hot. The only guy who could hit him was Moose, an old steel mill hand from the Sioux who was built like Grover Cleveland. Moose's swing was Klazuskian. The ball would rocket into the parking lot and even took out the base commander's El Dorado windshield once. Del Fatty bowled a perfect game on the alley next to mine. Scouts from the Yankees wanted to sign him when his hitch was up. Carl told me to hit one guy a game, to never go for the head, but go at their best hitter so that he'll never have a chance to dodge it. I did that, scowling in with a three-day Magley stubble. So young people aren't going to know. Magley, Sal Magley was a pitcher for the Giants, and he always had about a three-day uh, growth. And so uh, even in high school, I would let my beard grow out a little bit before games. In fact, the teacher, uh, one of the, we were playing in a school called West Town Friends, and the the coach, uh, the coach of, of their team said, "Who is that guy out there? He reminds me of Fidel Castro." You know, I don't look anything like Fidel Castro, but just the suggestion of a beard, I guess, was enough for him. But I, sh I should tell you that the idea of hitting one batter a game, I continued to do that. Uh, I always hit one batter a game. I never hit him in the head. And I remember playing a school, uh, Archmere Academy in Delaware. Uh, their uh, center fielder was a guy named Duke Evans. Their left fielder was a guy named Joseph Biden. <laughs> if you recall that name. <laughs> so... Uh, I remember showing up at their field and uh, there were a bunch of kids hanging around. And they said, you guys are really going to be sorry when Duke shows up. So they came out and, you know, I, I had never played against these guys before. I looked them over and I didn't see anybody who fit the name Duke. So first inning, their third batter comes up. And he hits a ball that goes about, it's a foul ball about 450 feet. I said, that's, that's Duke. <laughs> so I walked him and the next inning I hit him. And I, I can't remember, I, I think I walked him the following time. I was not about to throw the ball anywhere near him. I, Biden didn't get a hit that game. And... Uh, Truth be told, I was looking, this is a bit of bragging here. I was looking through uh, some old newspaper clippings and it was the uh, uh, the all-conference team for the Quindependent, I don't know what the conference was, Quindependent Conference. And uh, uh, first team left field, Ken McCullough. Second team left field, Joseph Biden. So when I see him next, I can say, Joe, do you remember when you were second team and I was first team? I, this is a poem that is set in somewhere in Eastern Montana, no specific place. Uh, I lived in Montana for five years and I still go back out there whenever I can to get up into the mountains. It's, it's a really important place to me. But this is Eastern Montana, very flat. Everybody has one leg shorter than the other from leaning away from the wind. Um, and this is titled, Until a Break in the Weather. It was a small hotel, but well appointed in a town near a long abandoned gold mine, a small town yet prosperous. A preposterous trundle bed for four in the living quarters, a brass spittoon and a brass bed in every room, and once in a blue moon, a brass band strode by in the street below. Sitting Bull slept in the lobby once, and earlier, Custer, shirtless, 
was mustered out, bewildered. Blue duck or black duck or some duck holed up for a week. I came here when I was in between. The darkness in my room resembled me. The sunsets the same. I could or I couldn't. I read the copy of Ben-Hur and took some notes on nothing in particular. I had no real conversations except with myself. And my father showed up in a dream one afternoon. But when I left after 11 days, the road I took led me soon to you and to our children. It was a small hotel, but well appointed. Wonderfully uh, written, and the turn at the end is, is marvelous. I think. Well, I, uh, one, one. I have to butt in before I forget it. One side note: I was up at the. Uh, it, it's a town up in the mountains in North Carolina. I'm not sure what the town is called. Near Blowing Rock, something like that. There was a, there was an old hotel called the Esmeralda, where they had they had filmed a silent. A movie with Douglas Fairbanks. And I had a room there in which uh, General Lou Wallace finished the last chapter of Ben Hur. So I thought I would pay homage to, <laughs> to Ben Hur there. Mm. Uh, I did a lot of driving when I was in Montana. And uh, this was before books on tape. And so you, know, you you would do a lot of really pretty good thinking on those drives. And when you got to your destination, there would be a whole raft of things that uh, you would be able to jot down that would turn into things like that particular poem. Mm -hmm. uh, as a writer, um, both of prose and of, of poetry, are there resource books that you use or have recommended? Well, uh, in my town, Winona, we have a sonnet contest. So uh, we get every summer we get four to eight hundred sonnets to read. Most of them, pretty good. <laughs> uh, you'll read a batch and you'll think. Wow, how am I going to choose between these? These are all, you know, right up there. Um, one thing I tell people, for example, who are, who are looking at sonnets is to say, go back and look at Robert Frost. There are a bunch of sonnets. There, there, there are a bunch of his sonnets which are poems which are sonnets, but they don't appear to be because the form is, you know, the, they're broken up into three line stanzas and then a two line stanza and you don't spot it. Um, which is something for me that I discovered, I guess maybe 20 years ago because I used to dislike Robert Frost's poetry. I'm not sure why, maybe it was because everybody else liked it. You know, I wasn't about to like something that was popular. But then I, I, I sat down and I think it probably came out of having to teach Robert Frost. Um, I saw many things there that, that I saw as being very valuable and I could point students to them. Uh, as to anthologies, I, I don't know anymore. Generally, what I do is I'm, I may pick out particular poems by a, a, a writer and give them to a, a person and say, do you see what's going on here? Lately, I've been reading a lot of William Stafford, and I find that I write parodies of his poems. Uh, and that's very useful. So I, I will... I will say to students, students or friends, okay, 
give me a poem you really like or dislike and write a parody of it. And I'm not talking about a, you know, goofy put down, but something which is paying attention to what it's doing, but is your poem. For example, I used to really, and this is going to offend some of your listeners, I really used to dislike John Ashbery's poems. So what I would do occasionally is I would sit down with an Ashbery poem and write a parody of it. And I would come out with some pretty good stuff. So I began to develop an appreciation for his work by doing that. So I think that's more of a kind of a forensic approach to, uh, to poetry. If, if, you, if you go through any of my books, you'll see that I have words circled everywhere and phrases circled. In my early years, I, I would have notebooks full of words. And occasionally I'd go back and look at those words. And it might be, let's say, words from Lawrence Durrell's Black Book. And I would see words that connected with each other and boom, boom, boom. I would I would have a, a poem that was derivative of, of Lawrence Durrell. Um, there are problems with that. You know, whenever you do anything which is derivative, you have to be careful. And a lot of what you read these days is derivative or, or in any period of time. If it's good, it's not derivative. If it's bad, it's derivative and you can see it. Ken, can we get you to read two last poems and then sure. tell our listeners how they can get hold of your books. Okay. Okay, a, a poem about crows. It's titled Corvi, plural of Corvus. A spell of warm days, unseasonable. No skin of ice on the horse tank. Two gangs of crows veer through the treetops. Eyes black, eyes intent on infiltrating the penumbra of darkness inside the barn. They fear, but never enter. They shine like dark stars until I raise my left hand and the youngest of them falls almost to the ground. Outside the fence, stench of a fawn they've pulled the tendons from. Can they hear my thoughts? See the hollow bones beneath my shirt? Last week, I came upon their congregation circled in the snow, the leader gurgling, the others cawing, dodging their heads in anger or agreement. West of Choto, my uncle lived with a crow. He moved his body in crow fashion and spoke only with gestures of his head. Before the crow, there was a woman, but she disappeared. Just a pair of elk hide slippers. Five days ago, there was still black ice under the snow. They tried to will me to fall and crack my head, but I could hear their minds look down the hallways of their bodies. I hide things from them, slide a stale muffin under a heavy shovel, a photograph taken 50 years ago, stuck in a cracked ceramic jug. Disconcerted, they always find them. A crow is a crow is a crow. This morning, two black tail feathers on the steps when I go to feed my horses. Wonderfully done. Wonderful. Thank you. A glass from Zimmy's. It's a tavern in uh, Ibbing, Minnesota, named for Bob Zimmerman. This involves Staten Island, where I was born, and Newfoundland, where I lived, I guess, the, <clears throat> the most important years of my childhood. Uh, my mother was from Nova Scotia. My father was from Mississippi. Uh, they got together in Staten Island. Foggiest. I grew up on islands. 
Once on Staten Island, the fog was so thick, the ferry didn't run, school was canceled, and our mother served us fog as thick as chowder. In Newfoundland, the densest fog brought everything to a standstill. You had to edge sideways into it. Fishermen disappeared, and Virginia Creek didn't flow. Our mother often braided my sister's hair, but when we were fogbound for a week, she became adept at braiding the fog slowly, delicately, and when she was done, it held for half a minute before it unwound, caressed her face in blue light, then dissipated. So you ask me where people can get uh, my books. Um, Amazon, you can find many of them. A books, the ones that are were out of print, uh, you can find copies on a and in on a books and what's the other one a libris hmm. uh, i should say that that it's been wonderful talking with you as i mentioned before uh, south carolina is a uh, a place that's uh, close to my heart 